What's up everybody? So this right here is pretty much me in bed on a Monday morning, probably like you guys too. Now in this video, we're gonna be talking about gene editing. So this is an HL video, right? The HL details, the extra HL details you guys need to know. Now guys, remember, go check out teachme.org, spelled like this, right? Unfortunately, some noodle head out there took the real spelling of teachme.org, so I have to stick with this one, but you know, I kind of like it still. Go check it out for awesome notes and lots and tons and tons of IB style questions to prepare you guys as much as possible for your final exams. So as you can see here, guys, the content of this video is not as much as we would normally have for our other videos, right? And that's kind of nice for once. Now, you guys might be wondering, what the heck are these two guys doing here? Because we're gonna be talking about gene editing. And to edit genes, you'll see later when we talk about it, we need some kind of tool to break and remove that harmful or bad gene that we don't want. And then we need another thing to help us fix up that and put in a new gene that we want or whatever. So you'll see the, um, a little bit more later when we talk about that. The first thing we're gonna focus on is gene knockout. So what do you guys think of when you think of knockout? When I, when I think of knockout, I think boxing or fighting. When someone gets hit so hard, they lose consciousness, they become useless, they become, they, they don't have any function anymore. They're out, they're gone, right? So gene knockout is pretty much the same thing. It's when we literally kind of knock out a gene, we make it useless, kind of silence it make it not work anymore. And we're gonna talk about that much more now. Before we go into that, let's real quick recap the, uh, something very important. Remember guys, our genes, our DNA is our instruction manual. It codes for all the proteins, right, of our body. One segment will, will code for one protein, another gene will code for another protein. And if all of them work properly, then we work properly, right? Then we're healthy and strong and all that, right? So it goes from DNA, we do transcription and make an mRNA, and then translation to make that protein, right, which will have that function. Now you can imagine, if we silence a gene, meaning we make it useless, like when you knock someone out, then we can't make that mRNA, and then we can't, that, that, that um, person or that organism will not be able to make that protein. And if they can't make that protein, then guess what? Then some function will not be carried out and we will see some effect in the body. Maybe they'll have a disease. Maybe they'll have some side effect, something like that, right? We'll be able to see that. Now, that's exactly what gene knockout is, okay? It's essentially when we render a gene unusable to see its effect that the effect that it has on an organism. So let me use a really cool example I like to use is a bicycle, right? If you don't know, if your family members never taught you what parts of the bicycle do what, pretty much like me, I'm pretty, I pretty much know wheels can roll and the pedal can pedal and the, and the steering wheel can turn. That's pretty much my knowledge with bikes. Now, if I wanted to figure out what each part does, how can I figure it out without asking someone to tell me? I can go and remove that part and then see what the outcome is. So for example, let's, let's take the wheels. Let's say I didn't know what wheels do. So I take them off and I try and ride the bike. Then I'm gonna discover, oh, I can't go. I know now what the function of these wheels are. The same thing with every other part. If you remove this seat, you'll be like, oh, that's uncomfortable. It feels like this thing's sticking up my butt, right? So that way you can figure out the function of each thing. So by removing each part, you can figure out its function. Right? So we can think of this analogy here. Now let's go back to the real world here with our DNA. So we know, right, I talked about this before, the Human Genome Project. You know the Human Genome Project? It's a project where somebody once upon a time tried to basically, you know how our DNA is a bunch of letters put together, a long sequence of A, C, T, G, and random orders to form the whole sequence of our DNA, right? So what someone did was, some scientists, is they decided to go and pretty much take our DNA and write it in a, in a book, write the whole sequence out, okay? They wrote the entire sequence of our DNA, so it took like a really long time, because you can imagine that's a lot of letters you gotta write, like a book. Now, this was called the Human Genome Project, where they've tried to write out the sequence of all our DNA, right? Now the thing is, it's one thing to be able to write out the sequence of our DNA, but this doesn't mean we know what all the sequences do. So one way to see what all the sequences do, what each gene is, um, what, what the purpose of each gene is, is like this bicycle analogy. We can silence certain sequences and see what the outcome is, okay? Now, my next question is, 
is this testable on humans? Can we, can a scientist be like, okay, you, you, the, you there, come here. I'm going to do an experiment, an experiment on you where I'm going to silence, I'm going to knock out some genes and see what the outcome is. Will you be like, hell yeah, I'll do that. That sounds cool. No, you will not, right? Because it's dangerous. Maybe this, by removing that sequence, it's, you, you may die because maybe that protein was so important to your survival that you, without it, you'll be dead. Um, it's unethical, right? Because we don't know the outcome. It's really risky and you can't just sacrifice someone's life potentially or, or give them really bad consequences if they don't die. So it's very unethical, right? It's very unethical and it's expensive because to be able to people, you'd have to pay people, right? No one's going to do that for free. Maybe if you pay them a lot of money, they might. Maybe you need a lot of equipment to make it, to, to regulate them if they get sick so you can help them again. It's going to be expensive, right? So what do we do? I don't like this too much, but you know, other than humans, we have to go to animals. It's the most, it's the closest thing to humans. Um, so we got to go to animals. Now, this, a lot of, I don't, I, and really initially, I really hated the idea. I was like, oh, we can't test on animals. It's like really unfair. But the thing is, if you really think about it, the reason why your grandparents or your parents can, can um, overcome certain diseases and maybe live 10 years longer, or 20 years longer, is because of the research um, that, are, that is done on organisms like mice and uh, rabbits and things like that, where we figure out these things and try and get answers and medications and the best medications without side effects and the best treatments so that us humans can benefit from it. So it is really bad because we are sacrificing animals' well-being for the sake of ours. So there's no, it's re that's really why it is a very big debate and there is no real right answer. It just seems that is the way it is done because it's better that way than on humans. And that's all I can say. I really don't like it too much, but it, it seems to be the way it is. So instead of humans, what do we use? We call these organisms model organisms. So most likely they're mice or the, the lab mice or something like that, right? It's an organism. A model organism is an organism used in place of another organism like a human for ethical and practical purposes. Now, to be able to figure figure it out. So instead of going to a human and be like, yo, I'm gonna remove this gene and I'm gonna see the outcome, then they're gonna go to the mouse and remove the gene and see the outcome. Uh, because there are actually a ridiculous amount of similarities between um, model organisms and humans. So you might be like, oh, but how is using a mice related to humans? Because mice and other organisms actually share a ridiculous amount of genes with us. There's so many genes that are the exact same in mice and it isn't us. So actually by doing a lot of these experiments and removing certain genes and you see the outcome, it would be very accurate to what would happen in humans because of the overlapping genes. So it's actually very reliable, okay, to actually compare a mouse outcome to a human. That's actually very surprising to most people. Now, it's not exactly precise, but it's very, very similar. So it's worth it to do it before doing it on humans. Now, the other reason is it's easy to maintain and control. You can imagine it'd be so harsh to try and do an experiment on a human and say, I'm going to watch you 24 hours a day, stay in this cage here so I can watch what you're eating. I can watch exactly what you're doing so I can make this experiment as accurate as possible. That'd be cruel, right? It's not easy to maintain and control that, to control the human. Whereas an uh, organism, like a model organism, you can literally... Um, put them in a cage and you can watch them. You can monitor exactly what they eat because you feed them. You can monitor exactly what they do and all those things. It's really easy to maintain and control, right? And the last thing is their life cycle is much shorter. So if you were to do some sort of, um, let's say, remove a gene from a person, you want to see the outcome, you may have to wait a whole lifetime because humans live long and maybe the outcome takes a long time to happen. Whereas model organisms like mice, they have a way shorter lifespan. So you can do an experiment, remove a gene or silence a gene and the outcome would happen way faster because their lives are way shorter than ours. So therefore you would get results much quicker than you would if you were to do it on a human. Okay, so those are three very important reasons why we can use model organisms instead of humans, okay? Now, we call an organism from which we silence a gene a knockout organism. So if you use the mice, to remove a gene to see its outcome, that's called a knockout organism because you knocked out one of its genes to be able to see the outcome, okay? So that's very, 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 very important stuff you guys need to know. Um, I hope it makes sense. It is, it is definitely sad. I don't like the idea, but just the way it is, we can't really change much about that. Um, now, my next question is um, this. What is the purpose of gene knockout? What is the purpose of removing a gene or silencing a gene? 
in, in a human being or in a model organism. Why do we care about this? Why do we want to do that? The first reason is obvious, right? We talked about it. It's to study gene function. It's to see what the purpose of that gene was because now we look at the outcome and we see what changed. Now we know, ah, that's what that gene did. Now, what's the next? What's another reason? Modeling human disease. So say, for example, there's a scientist who really wants to study diabetes, okay? Diabetes, right? Um, diabetes type one or type two or whatever, but he doesn't really know well how it works because he can't like take a, take a human into a lab and analyze them and see exactly what's going on, right? Because of all these reasons, you can't do it. So what they can do is they can take a model organism, give them diabetes, right? Because they can remove some genes and all that to basically give them diabetes. Um, by removing, for example, genes that make insulin. Now that now basically this this um, organism will have diabetes because they can't control their blood glucose. And by doing that, now the scientists can observe this mice um, over over time and see what the side effects are, what kind of symptoms this mouse gets, what kind of uh, changes happens in the mouse in the mice's life, what how how long they live, all of these things. So. You can do it to model human disease, to induce a, a human disease in an animal so you can study them and see the effects and learn a lot more about it. Because, for example, we can give this mice a gene knockout and then we can study and see, okay, now it has diabetes. Let's try these medications that we think might help diabetes. And they can try it on the mice and see which one works the best. And then if they see, oh, this one works really well, then the next step will be to try and do it on humans. Because then that way in the future, perhaps we can cure diabetes or really help people with diabetes, right? So it's very important for modeling human disease, inducing a disease so we can study the disease much better, okay? Um, last one, not so important, developmental biology. So when we grow up from being a embryo all the way up to a big, big boxer like Mike Tyson, we... Development is a whole process requiring many genes to be made, many proteins to be made. Now, there are many developmental congenital, like congenital means from birth, right? There are many congenital malformations um, that can happen, like cleft lip is one of them. Um, certain spine disorders like spina bifida, you guys don't need to worry about that. But all of these are due to some problem in genes that occur when you're very young, right? As a baby, so you malform. So they can do experiments like this um, on a on a... A mouse embryo from the beginning and induce these changes, um, uh, silence some genes to see how the mouse grows up with these congenital problems. And again, discover how they can treat it better, how they can fix this. So it's also important in developing and developmental biology. But don't worry too much about this. I'd say these first two are the most critical to understand the real purpose of it. So that's it that we're going to talk about for uh, gene knockout. Okay. So I hope it helps. So, and, and in terms of other diseases that can be induced in these mice would be obesity, um, anxiety, um, long life, um, cancer development, any kind of things like that to study those human diseases and try and improve them. Okay, so that's it for gene knockout. Um, I'm curious also what you guys think about the whole um, using model organism and those kind of things in science, what your preference is. Do you think this is good for the future? Do you think it should not be done? I'm really curious what you guys think as well. So now let's move on to talking about a gene editing mechanism invented by two female scientists, right? I'm going to talk about CRISPR now. So we just talked about how you can knock out genes, right? You can basically silence them, you can remove them. Um, all of this falls under the category of gene editing. There's ways now invented that we can physically go into our cells and edit the DNA. Isn't that insane? Because in that way, we can change the outcome. We can fix people's mutations. That's crazy. Now, the big question I want to ask you is when is the best time to do gene editing in your lifetime? The best time is right after your mom's um, egg and your dad's sperm meets to form your first cell called the zygote, right? Because that cell will have all your DNA and it may have a mutation. And if that cell duplicates and duplicates, your whole body, once you're formed, will have that mutation. All your cells will have that mutation. So it'd be very hard to fix. But if you edit that very first cell's DNA, you fix it. Um, and then after you fix it, that cell will now duplicate and duplicate and become you. All your cells will be normal. All your cells will not have that mutated DNA. So in the zygote phase, the very early phase of your life, you want to do this editing to fix you. If you had to try and um, fix it later when you're older, it'd be so hard because you have so many cells, right? And all of them have this mutation and it'd be, imp it'd be impossible to fix them one by one, right? It's very tough. So 
Best is earliest, bear that in mind. So we're gonna go now through this mechanism invented by these two female scientists. I think they're from France um, a while ago, not very recent. And um, there are three key components to this, right? You're gonna see these three guys in this one. I want you to really pay attention to them. So how does it work? How does it work? It's pretty cool. And I want you to pay attention because this thing is very likely to be asked in paper two questions, like your long answers, right? Because it's a process here. They may ask you to describe CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, right? And then you have to write all that crap out. So pay attention here, try and understand it. It's gonna be very easy, okay? So it starts off with our little what? Our test tube here. And we have two key components, guide RNA and Cas9. I want you to think of Cas9 like a scissor, okay? This one is gonna be the actual thing you'll see later that's gonna cut out that piece of uh, mutated DNA. It's gonna be the scissor, Cas9. Now guide RNA, I want you to think about like a little brain. It's like a little brain, okay? So you know when you, you go and you need to cut something out of, out of a paper, your brain is gonna decide where you cut, right? It's gonna guide you to where you cut. And then your hands, I mean the scissors, will actually do the cutting. And then your hands, which we'll talk about later, what molecule that is, your hands is gonna control your scissor to cut that gene, okay? So, so far we got two of these players here. Now, the guide RNA, remember RNA and DNA, they can, there's complementary base pairing where A binds with T and so on. Now, basically what these scientists do is they locate your mutated DNA and they look at that sequence that they wanted, that they, that's the problem sequence. Then they make an RNA that is complementary to that mutated DNA. Because if this RNA is complementary, say this sequence here, if that sequence is complementary to it, then if you inject it into your cell, then that means this, this mRNA, this, I mean, this RNA, this guide RNA is gonna migrate towards that area and do complementary base pairing because it's complementary to that area. So step one, they find the mutated DNA, they look at the sequence, they make a guide RNA that complements that because that area is gonna be like the brain. It's gonna guide the scissors towards the area that we wanna cut out, okay? So that's very key, that's the first step. This guide mRNA created specifically for your mutated DNA. This ensures that this guy doesn't go everywhere and cause all your genes to be removed. It is made specifically uh, complementary to the mutated DNA that we want removed, okay? Now, step two, okay, is we're gonna add these Cas9, these scissors, into the mix, okay? So we mix now these. Now we're gonna take this stuff and we're gonna inject it into that cell. Remember, especially one of your first cells, like your zygote, um, we're gonna inject it into that. Now next, it's gonna be interesting, before I reveal it. So here we have now that gene, here's our mutated area. So if we inject now our Cas9, our scissors, and our guide the RNA, which is like the brain, into the cell, what's gonna happen? You can imagine, let me show you. So first, we're gonna have this, what? Let me try and match it for those who have cringe. Okay, so there we have it. So the guide RNA, because it has complementary base pairing, will go and bind to that mutated DNA by complementary base pairing. That's perfect. Now, the problem is there's no scissors. So what they actually do, um, I'll fix it for you guys now. I'm just gonna label it because I know you guys like the labeling. So how would you solve this problem? There's no scissors. So what they do is they have, when we add these two into this mix, they actually bind together. So this guide RNA, let me show you, will in fact actually go into our scissors, okay? This is, remember, this this big guy like here is our Cas9, it's our, it's our protein. That's gonna act like scissors, it's gonna be the scissors. Let me label it here for you guys. So now, because this Cas9 is attached to this gRNA, wherever this gRNA, this guide RNA goes, the Cas9 will go, because they're linked. So if the guide RNA is gonna to go to this mutated area and bind by complementary base pairing, now this Cas9 has no choice but to come with, okay? It's linked to it, okay? They're associated with each other. Now, when this happens, now we're almost there. Now we're really close. Now the scissors, remember, if you leave scissors on a table, it won't just cut the paper by itself. If you put the scissors on the paper, is it gonna cut? No, right? You need a hand. You need something to actually make the scissors cut. And that's gonna be this little area here. So if we call this area the mutated 
DNA sequence, right? There's a small area very adjacent right next to the, the mutated DNA. We call that the PAM sequence. I'm going to write label it here for you guys. The PAM sequence. I'm going to label like this because why not? And I like to think of it like it's like fingers. Once, once this whole complex binds, now these little, this PAM sequence, by the way, we'll see what it stands for now. Um, it's called protospacer adjacent motif. So the protospacer is another name for the mutated DNA sequence. So the protospacer DNA mutated sequence adjacent sequence. So the sequence adjacent to the protospacer sequence. So this PAM, that's why they call it PAM. So you don't have to say all that the whole time. This area, once the Cas9 and the gRNA binds, this will behave like the fingers and it's going to activate the Cas9 to actually cut this mutated area. Okay, so the PAM sequence, think of it like little fingers, okay, that's actually doing the cutting. So now let's reveal some words for you guys. So the guide RNA identifies the mutated DNA sequence and Cas9 uses the PAM sequence, the little fingers, um, protospacer adjacent motif. Um, to anchor to the DNA and actually cut it, okay? So now, once it's been cut, let me show you this. So once we actually cut out that, that piece, okay, that specific piece, now what happens? Now, one of two things can happen. We can either leave it like that and the DNA will adhere to each other and now there's just a missing gene, which is, which is one option, right? If the gene was bad, now it's not there, so it's better. Or we can replace it with a new segment, an unmutated gene. So put the normal gene there, because if we just remove it, we're still missing a gene. So maybe there's a mutation, but now there's nothing. So you're still not making a protein, so it's still not very ideal. So the best thing would be to, in fact, replace that mutated gene that you had with the unmutated one. So you can have now normal function again, right? So it can make that protein like normal, okay? so. That's really the, the, the gist of it. So make sure you know these steps, one to seven. It is really quite straightforward. Just think of guide RNA like our little brain guiding us towards the area where we want to cut this paper. And then Cas9 is going to be the scissors that's going to do the cutting. But without the PAM sequence, our fingers, that um, Cas9 will not cut the paper. Okay, so that's it for our, our CRISPR Cas9 gene editing mechanism. Very, very cool. It's one of the biggest discoveries recently in science. It's like the discovery of the wheel. Okay, it's really, really useful. And it's a lot of potential in the future for scientists like this. Okay, just like we edit our essays on the computer, delete, insert, cut, whatever. Now we're able to do that with DNA. It's really, really interesting. The next thing now is we talk now about gene editing and how we can even do it, right? Using this CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism. Now we need to, it's, Ivy loves to do this, analyze the hell out of, the, out of everything, advantages, disadvantages, you know, what's the TOK about this, whatever. So there is unfortunately this little part, but I try to make it nice and concise and clear on one page for you guys. We're gonna talk about the pros and cons of gene editing. They could always ask this in a long answer question. So just, here are some few things, key things that you can, or should definitely mention, which will help you out get all the points. So the advantages of gene editing, very obvious, number one, to delete a harmful gene, right? Because we can delete genes now, like sickle cell disease, and we can try and fix that. So we have normal red blood cells that carry oxygen normally. So we can have brains that don't degenerate at a young age, like in Huntington's disease. We can even go to as far as to deleting full on chromosomes, like in Down syndrome. Okay. Now, what's number two? Optimize or amplify. So in example one, we talked about how we can remove bad genes. What if, but because now we can edit genes, what if we can just improve a gene. Maybe it's not a bad gene, it's not a harmful gene, but we can make it even better. We can optimize or amplify function. So this is very useful in agriculture where we make, edit the genes of certain plants to be able to make them grow faster, make more food, make them resistant to harsh weather conditions, certain pests, all those kind of things. So not deleting a harmful gene, but you're optimizing or editing that gene to make it even stronger, even better, okay? Now, what about disease transmission? So there's even a way that, you know how mosquitoes, when they bite you, if they carry some sort of parasite, you can get infected with that parasite. For example, malaria, right? In Africa, it happens uh, very frequent, right? So, because I'm from South Africa, so it's very much present in Africa, where these guys will just bite you and you'll get, so the mosquito itself is not dangerous, but the, the parasite that it carries is. So there's ways that they've been able to 
edit um, the DNA of a mosquito to make it not be able to pass on that virus to you, make them non-infective. And that's very cool because if they do that, um, if this, this guy has a baby and he has a baby, then all these mosquitoes that form, they will all not be able to pass on this, this um, parasite. And so we can, in a way, eradicate that disease just by making, just by changing one of their DNA to make them not be able to transmit this disease. So that's very, very cool. So there's one key word here, gene drive. So this is basically when you make a gene susceptible to being passed on from one generation to the next. So there's even ways they can edit the, the DNA. So for example, as I just talked about with the malaria, they can edit it so it makes the makes a gene drive, meaning a mechanism that increases the chances of this gene being passed on to the next generation. So that after a while, you form a billion mosquitoes because they just did, uh, um, they just make babies and make babies forever and forever. And now you have all these mosquitoes that are actually not dangerous anymore. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's one other advantage. Now, what's the disadvantages? Germ cell effects. Remember, guys, in the SL video, we talked about somatic and germ cells. Somatic cells are your body cells, all of them except your sperm and your egg, right? But your sperm and your egg, if they have a mutation, that means when you have a kid, you can pass that mutation onto your kid, right? So, for example, if you accidentally edit a germ cell, right, and it doesn't go well, then that person, their kid will also have that effect. So it's pretty dangerous. You can create future problems if you accidentally um, affect germ cells, right? Off-target effects. And I like to think of this as friendly fire, right? Maybe you're trying to fight someone with your friend and you accidentally shoot your friend in the back of the head. Uh, friendly fire, you didn't mean to, but it happens. So sometimes when you try and make these edits on a specific gene, you accidentally edit another gene which was not meant to be edited. Unintentional effects because Obviously, it's a new thing, this gene editing, so it's not perfect yet, and certain uh, side effects can happen, off-target effects can happen. Okay, cool. Last one here is time. So even though we're able to do this gene editing, and I said, remember, we always, coming back to gene knockout, we always do it first on model organisms, and this takes years and years, and then we eventually move on to humans, which takes many uh, clinical trials of many more years, and eventually it comes rolled out to public, so it's really safe, it takes many years to develop. Now, why is that a disadvantage? Because if we, some scientist discovers, oh, we can edit this gene, there's time problem. It doesn't mean that we can do it yet. All of these things will take time to first do on animals and then eventually clinical trials and eventually humans. So a lot of this stuff, the disadvantage is that it's still down the road. It's not really here yet, although the theory is. Okay, so that's it. So I hope this, I kept this nice and straightforward. Three advantages, three disadvantages of our gene editing, okay? So uh, you can even think of more, right? These are not the only limits because you can think gene editing, another disadvantage, um, ethical reasons. What if people start using it to change their eye color? What if they're doing it to start changing their hair color, change the way a baby looks? What if they start using it not for health benefits, but for the sake of um, changing beauty or strength or things like that where it's now you're changing the person. You're not just fixing them anymore from, from a disease. You're now actually changing who they are. So where is the line? Where exactly do we draw the line? So there's a whole ethical debate you can have with this. So these are three and these are three, but you can think of many more. Don't limit them to this. I just wanted to give you a few. Okay. So let's go on to the last thing. We're going to talk about conserved and highly conserved sequences. And you might be like, what is that, my guy? It's not bad. It's going to be pretty quick, this little last segment. And then we're going to do some questions, okay? A couple questions. So conserved and highly conserved sequences, right? So our DNA has long sequences, right? Each sequ uh, one sequence could be one gene, and the next sequence of letters is another gene, and so on, right? Now, what do we mean by conserved and highly conserved sequences? So a conserved sequence is one that barely ever gets mutations. And a highly conserved sequence is one that literally never gets mutations. It's even rarer to get mutations. Because we know, right, if we look at, for example, human beings 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, if we look at someone's DNA from 500 years ago compared to someone's now, we can, if we compare our gene sequences, right, there's a whole science of that, like genomics is where they look at these sequences and they compare between different organisms and see the similarities and differences and they have to use any fancy computer programs to do so. If we compare, we will notice some sequences 
Some gene sequences stayed exactly the same, and some had a lot of mutations over time, a lot of changes compared to before. So why is that? Why are some, these are two, two chromosomes, by the way, why are some genes susceptible to mutations, to change over many hundreds of thousands of years? And why do other ones um, st um, stand the test of time? Why do they not mutate? Why are they conserved? We're going to talk a little bit about that now, okay? So there are two reasons for this. We're going to talk about them here. Two reasons for why... Um, some areas, some sequences are highly conserved or conserved. And we're going to talk about them. These two reasons you absolutely need to know. And it'd be better if you understand them because then you don't have to memorize anything here. So before we really quick look at those two, we need to understand what mutation rate is, right? So mutation rate, how scientists define it, is just if we look at some sequence, um, ACTG, blah, blah, for some DNA, for some DNA sequence, some gene, um, a mutation rate will refer to how many changes there are in the genetic sequence over time. In other words, the number of base pairs, so ACTOG, changing in a gene each generation so, or, or each cell division. So how often these, the rate of the change of these sequences, so changing from an A to a T or C to a G or whatever, any change in the base over time, that is mutation rate. So the higher the mutation rate means the more changes in those bases there are over time the more quickly they change compared to other sequences, right? That's very straightforward, to be fair, right? So now let's, let, let's look here. What is our first reason for why some, some sequences barely change over time? Let's look. Functional requirement. So, you know, there are some sequences, some genes, for example, that code for DNA replication proteins, right? Like helicase, um, or, or some genes that code for ribosomes, or tRNA, or rRNA. Any of these sequences, they are so important to keep us alive. If we can't do DNA replication, then we're going to die, okay? For example, other ones would be proteins that are involved in cell respiration, right? Making ATP. For example, cytochrome C. Remember this one you guys learn about in cell respiration. And ferredoxin, you guys learn about this one and its role in cell respiration. It's very important. And if these guys, for example, if they get a mutation, then you're screwed, because they're so important for the basic function of life to make ATP. If they get a mutation and not work anymore, then you will die. You will simply not pass on this mutated DNA anymore. Same here. If you have a mutation in your helicase, that means you can't do DNA replication properly anymore. And so you'll die and you won't pass on this mutated or changed sequence to your baby, which means only the people who don't get changes will pass on their DNA. And so over time, there will be no change in um, generation after generation in the sequence because only those who who were able to not have a mutation would survive and therefore only those can pass on their DNA to their baby. So we call this reason functional requirements. We need these genes to survive. If they are mutated, we will just die. Therefore, they don't get mutated over time because those people who get mutated will not survive and they'll just die. Okay, I hope that makes sense. That's very, very one very key reason. So one way when we can think about it is Natural selection, right, survival of the fittest, conserves such sequences by necessity because if we get a mutated sequence, we will just not, we'll just die and won't pass it on. So one kind of natural selection is called purifying selection or negative selection. And it's basically the phenomenon where our, we automatically eliminate harmful variations of genes by not surviving because when we get that mutation in that gene, we just die. So that's called purifying selection because if you get that mutation, you die and, uh, you won't pass on that, that harmful mutation. What's our next reason then? Slower mutation rate. So scientists believe that some sequences like these that are used very often um, will mutate far more slowly, will have far slower mutation rate compared to other sequences which are maybe not used as frequently in our body. And the reason is not necessarily, okay, let me reveal this. I'm going to talk too much nonsense now. So slow mutation rate. So key sequences, high risk ones, which are used a lot, um, has more active DNA repair mechanisms. So it doesn't mean that this area has less mutations. It just means this area has more active DNA repair mechanisms. So if there is a mutation, uh, a system like RNA polymerase or DNA polymerase will go and fix that area and fix that mutation before trouble occurs 
whereas other areas which are less active, less important, they will also have mutations the same way this area does, but the DNA repair mechanism will be less active in this area. And so mutations will build up and build up in these other areas and be passed on, okay? So it does not mean that these areas will have low mutation rates. It just means that they have higher or more active DNA repair mechanisms to fix these mutations, okay? Because mutations happen pretty much at an equal rate everywhere. It's just the areas that have higher um, or more active DNA repair mechanisms will appear to have lower mutation rates because they're always fixed all the time. It's like the mistakes are fixed. It's like when your mom fixes your homework, it doesn't mean you make less mistakes in your homework. It just means somebody else fixes them for you so you don't get in trouble, okay? Kind of like that. Okay, so that's it for this. Now let's get on to some questions, guys. So again, guys, these are just gonna be three tiny questions for you guys. Go check out teachme.org. We have tons. I think at this point we have like 830 plus questions and we're planning to make thousands plus. So by the time for your exam, so you guys are all ready and fit to go, okay? So go check out teachme.org. Lot of lots of questions there. Not only multiple choice, also paper, um, the other paper ones, case-based questions, short answer questions, long answer questions, everything you need, okay? So which of the following best describes gene knockout? A gene is overexpressed to increase its function. No, a gene is deleted or inactivated to observe its effect. Yes, that's what gene knockout is. We're removing that gene to see its outcome. A gene is copied and transferred between organisms. No, a gene is amplified to create multiple copies. That's, no, that's more like the opposite of what we want here. So the answer is gonna be B. In CRISPR-Cas9, that whole mechanism we talked about in this video, Cas9 is gonna be the scissor, right? It acts like a little scissor. C, remember, the guide was the RNA, right? And the PAM sequence was the brain, okay? I mean, was the fingers. The brain, sorry, the brain uh, was like the guide, right? And the PAM sequence was like the fingers. That's gonna do the cutting. So it's gonna be C here. Okay, one more, different kind of style multiple choice. In CRISPR-Cas9 system, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system fun functions in which of the following ways? The Cas9 creates a double-stranded break in the DNA. That is true, right? That is another way of saying cutting the DNA. Um, so they're, they're gonna use funny sentences like this to confuse you, but all this means is cutting the DNA. So guide RNA directs Cas9 to the specific DNA sequence. That's true, remember? The guide RNA is like the brain directing our scissors towards the right place. Uh, so that's true, one and two is true. The system is naturally found in human cells. No. Not in human cells. I think the system can be found in bacterial cells, but um, the scientists, the two lady scientists that discovered it copied the bacterial cells mechanism and is using it in humans to help us edit DNA. But it's not naturally found in humans. The girl scientists had to make it. So the answer here is gonna be one and two. So the answer is gonna be B. So I really hope that was useful. Um, I know it's still a lot of content, but I hope it was fun and interesting and I will see you guys in the next one.